Okay, so uh, I am recording now, and uh, uh, let's let's talk about this for a little bit. Uh, some interesting stuff, and um, let me begin by uh, sharing with you that, uh, uh, in my opinion, and and based on the studies I've done and everything, uh, there are conflict management styles. We all have a style, and our predominant style is the one in most cases that we we uh, uh, grew up with that was in our uh, family of origin mm -hmm. and um, and that's how we've learned how to deal with conflict now as I said this is like at least a 30 hour course if you get the whole thing and one of the things we deal with is um, Conf, you know, if you want to have staying power in any situation, whether it be a church, a ministry, uh, a marriage, uh, you're going to have to learn how to deal with conflict because conflict is always going to be there. So it's not an issue as to how to live life conflict free. There's no way you're going to live life conflict free. You have to learn how to manage conflict. And, um, and so conflict in itself is neither good nor bad. It's neutral. It's what you do with it as to whether it's good or bad. As an example, same thing with money. Money is not good nor bad, but it's what you do with your money that determines whether it's good or bad in your situation. And the same thing is true with conflict. So uh, what we deal with in this uh, class of conflict management is helping people get a uh, re, uh, to develop a new paradigm when it comes to conflict. Um, most people hate conflict, and a new paradigm tells you that. Uh, and, and and I'm just giving you a nutshell concept here that that conflict. Um, um, a new paradigm is that conflict is an opportunity for growth. Without conflict, things don't grow. They stay the same and they stagnate. But because of conflict and dealing with it in the right way, situations grow, people grow, change and grow. And so that's a new paradigm when coming to conflict. So let's deal with four conflict management styles. And, uh, uh, you know, in my opinion, this would be something good to, uh, to uh, uh, what's the word I want, to um, uh, take notes on, okay? Uh, in, in, really, there's five styles, five styles. Two of them are what we would consider non-management styles, and yet people have these styles, because they're really not managing it. But... Uh, uh, so let, let me talk about the two non-management methods first. And the first one is accommodate, accommodating. Accommodating. A non-management method. Accommodating is a non-management method defined as giving in for the sake of a relationship. Giving in for the sake of a relationship. One can accommodate the interests of an adversary and capitulate to those interests. The attitude with accommodating is, in order for you to win, I have to lose. In order for you to win, I have to lose. And there is little or no interest satisfaction for the accommodator. There's little or no interest satisfaction for the person who accommodates. But there are a few times when accommodating serves us well. And here are some times when accommodating would serve well. Number one, when we need to build credit for the future. What do I mean by that? Maybe we're in a ministry and we know that there are going to have to be some drastic changes coming down the pike. And so the thing we're dealing with today is really minor compared to what we're going to be dealing with in the future. So I'm going to accommodate. I'm going to give in so I can build some credit for the future. 
So you won't think that it's always going my way. Does that, does that make sense? Another time when accommodating would serve well is when we desire harmony. I mean, sometimes you just want some peace. You just want some harmony. And the issue is not big enough to disrupt that. Another reason we might accommodate and it work for us is when we're willing to let others learn by their mistakes. Sometimes we know that by dealing with that the way they're going to deal with it, it's going to cause problems, but we know that's the only way they're going to learn. And so we're going to give in and accommodate. And then a fourth reason accommodating might work is when we know we might be wrong. As an example, Joyce Meyer, most of you know the name Joyce Meyer. She made this statement one time. She said, I think I'm right, but I could be wrong. And when we know we could be wrong in this situation, we're not 100% sure we might accommodate give in. So the first non-management method is accommodating. The second non-management method is avoiding. Avoiding is another non-management method and it's defined as taking oneself out of the conflict situation. I'm going to take myself out of this conflict situation and avoiding the conflict is one way to do that. But when would it work for us to avoid? In other words, even with these non-management methods, there are times when they work well. So when would it work well for us to avoid a situation? Well, first of all, is with regard to timing. Maybe it's just not the time to deal with it yet, so I'm going to avoid it. Secondly, avoiding makes sense when we have no power. Does that make sense? In other words, you're working uh, at Taco Bell. I'm just using that as an example. You're working at Taco Bell, and you're low man on the totem pole, and you know that you don't have any power over this decision, so you might as well just avoid it because you don't have any power. A third time you might effectively avoid a situation is when you need to count to 10 to cool off. I'm going to avoid this because if I deal with this now, it's not going to be pretty. Okay. A fourth time we might uh, benefit by avoiding is when the damage of the confrontation is just too great. The damage of the confrontation is just too great. And a fifth time that we might avoid is when the issue is trivial. It doesn't really matter. It's not a big deal. I'm just going to avoid it rather than make it into a big deal. Okay? But then there are three management methods. So there's five all together, and there's three management methods. Um, the first management, well, the third style, let's just say the third style is what we call competing. Competing. Fighting to win. The gist of competing is we're not in this to test the waters, we're in it to make waves. And it's a form of conflict behavior which can lead to the domination or eventual annihilation of one disputant by another. It requires that in order for me to win, you have to lose. In order for me to win, you have to lose. But when would it make sense to compete? The first time thing that makes sense to compete is with regard to timing. In other words, 
I have to compete in this situation because it's critical. It's critical. Another reason you might compete is when important issues or principles call for unpopular courses of action such as cutting costs, enforcing rules, or disciplining. Another time you might compete is when issues vital to the health of the church or the organization are at stake and you know you're right. Or when one must protect oneself against those who would take advantage. I'm going to compete because People are going to take advantage, and, and, and I can't let that happen. The fourth style is compromising. Compromising. And compromising may de be defined as meeting others halfway. I'm going to meet others halfway. And this is a way of sharing between conflicting parties. It's a way of sharing between conflicting parties. Implied here is a degree of giving in, which under more favorable circumstances would not be acceptable. And this mode requires that in order for each of us to win something, each of us must also lose something. And what might cause a person to compromise? Here's some reasons you might need to compromise. Compromising makes sense when goals are of moderate importance, but not worth the potential disruption of confrontive methods. In other words, they're not drastic situations, and if we, if we uh, deal with them the way I would like to deal with them, it might cause too many trouble, too much trouble. So I'm going to compromise. Or when temporary settlements for complex issues are advisable. When temporary settlements for complex issues are advisable. Another time might be when time pressures demand expedient solutions or when collaboration or confrontation is unsuccessful. When collaboration or confrontation is unsuccessful. And the fifth style is what we call the ideal management style. This is the ideal one, the best one. It's called collaboration. And collaboration means problem solving. Collaboration is a form of dispute resolution, which emphasizes interest satisfaction over issues resolution. Now, let me stop right here and say, in just a minute, I'm going to explain that in greater degree. But collaboration is a form of dispute resolution that emphasizes interest satisfaction over issues resolution. And philosophically and practically, collaboration encompasses the belief that the interests of one party will not be satisfied unless the interests of the other disputant are also satisfied. We have to satisfy both people's interests. And I'm going to talk about that in greater detail in just a minute. Or stated otherwise, every proposal for a resolution addresses the interest satisfaction of both disputants. So when should we use collaboration? With regard to timing, when the timing requires that we collaborate. The collaborative approach should be used when both sets of concerns are too important to be compromised. 
Both sets of concerns are too important to be compromised, therefore demanding an integrative solution. Here's another time you should collaborate. When learning is the objective, when the objective is to learn, or when multiple perspectives will bring insight. In other words, there's more ways to look at it with different people. You would collaborate when incorporating the concerns of all parties will up the commitment level from both parties and when interpersonal relationships have created hard feelings that have to be worked through. Okay. Now, that being said, I gave you the four conflict management styles, accommodating, avoiding, competing, compromising, and collaboration. Which is the best conflict management style to use in any given situation? In any situation? Yes. Well, you were saying that the ideal is the collaboration, right? One where somebody doesn't have to sacrifice, but it kind of just brings it all together, right? Yes. So if you have to pick one being the best, the best is collaboration. But in reality, the best conflict management style to use in any given situation is the one that's going to work based on the other person's conflict management style in other words collaboration is the best but yeah. if the other person does not know how to collaborate all they know how to do is compete you're going to have to move into a competing style got it does that make sense yeah um and so so the best conflict the the absolute best one is collaboration and if we could all learn collaboration wonderful but the ab because every both disputants' interests are being met in collaboration. But the absolute best style to use in any situation is the one that is needed because of the uh, uh, where the people are. Now that being said, I want to share a parable with you, and. Um, and, and we call it the parable of the orange, okay? And um, um, let me, let me uh, uh, the best way to do it is to just read this little parable to you. But because if you can get the parable of the orange, you get the crux of what I teach for 30 hours in a conflict management uh, course. So listen to this parable. I'm just going to read it here, and I'll, I'll stop and comment periodically. One day I gave an orange to each student in a conflict management class. I asked them what it was. They looked at me like I didn't know what I was talking about. Everybody knows it's an orange. But I asked them a question. Is this an orange? Is it a gift? Is it a paradigm? Is it a map? Is it a parable? Or all of the above? Then I told them the parable of the orange. You see, orange light shines on problem solvers. And when I saw a God idea in the orange, I thought I had a good framing tool for the Ministry of Conflict Management. A mother walked into her kitchen to find her daughters having World War III over an orange. Mom sliced it in two. She, she got upset. She walked over. She grabbed the orange. She got a knife. She sliced it in two equal halves with a butcher knife and explained, there the problem was solved. And she left the kitchen. She came back 10 minutes later, and the two girls were still arguing over the orange. Had she explained the interests or needs of her girls, or had she explored 
the interests or needs of her girls, had she asked one important question, she could have solved the problem. Why do you want the orange? One daughter wanted the skin to make an orange flavored cake, while the other wanted the fruit to eat. They had different interests, different interests or different reasons for wanting the orange. One daughter wanted the pulp, the other wanted the peel. But mom framed the problem in terms of an issue, not an interest. And here was the issue. There's only one orange who gets it. The position taken by each daughter was that each should get an orange for her own ends. But the Apostle Paul requires, quote, that each of you esteem and look upon and be concerned for not merely his own interests, but also for the interests of others, unquote, Philippians 2.4. And he also said, do nothing from factional motives or strife. So what's the point? If we work the issues from the interests, the interests being needs, goals, and vision, we won't get locked into positions that cause strife. Now there's three words there that are important. Interests, issues, and positions. You have to understand those three and what they mean. Interests, issues, and positions. So if we work the issues from the interests, which are the needs, the goals, and the visions, we won't get locked into positions which cause strife. Conflict that energizes us is okay. But strife isn't okay because it is destructive aggression. So when we work from the interests, the needs, goals, and visions of everybody, when we work from the interests, we are evaluating who-ness. Whereas when we work from positions or issues, we're validating whatness. Is this making sense to you? When we're dealing with person's interests, we're dealing with who. When we're dealing with issues, we're dealing with what? And the church tends to buy into a view of reality as a relationship to things, rules, and regulations in order to be valued, accepted, and loved. Whatness tends to be static and fragmented spirituality. Religion with no who there no sense of self or care for the personality. Whatness alone defaces the image of God. That is relational reality. Did you hear what I just said? Whatness alone defaces the image of God that is relational reality, the person image. And whatness becomes an outward journey ending in addiction and detachment. When we're always dealing with the what, the issue, we're not dealing with relationships. We're dealing with things. And it's an outward journey ending in addiction and detachment. We need teachers and leaders in the church who are orange peelers, not orange splitters. Who deal with Interests, not issues. Let me give you an illustration of how this operates. And I know I got to hurry because my time's running out. <clears throat> if you operate in a large church where there's a lot of events going on and you don't have a lot of rooms, you have to have uh, someone in charge of that, like an events coordinator who if you need a room, you go to them and say, I need such and such a room on such and such a date. Is it available? And if they say, yes, it's available, they put your name down and the time down so that that room is yours at that time. 
So let's say that I had an event when I was directing a, director of a Bible school. Let's say I had a, a recruiting event happening on a Saturday where I had parents and prospective students coming in. And I, I said, I need the fellowship hall and I need it from uh, nine o'clock to one o'clock because I have parents and, and, and they say, okay, I call. Is that room available? Yes, it's available. I schedule it. I invite parents and prospective students to come to our fellowship hall at such and such a time, nine o'clock on a Saturday. And so I drive in about eight o'clock to set everything up. And as I drive in, I see that there's activity in that room going in and out. And I think, uh oh, we've got an issue. And so I, I ask somebody, what's going on? And they say, well, we're having a volunteer appreciation banquet for, our, for all our volunteers at the church. Where at? In the fellowship hall. Whoa, we've got an issue. See, that's an issue. That's what? That's an issue. If I deal with it in regard to cutting the orange, dealing with the issue, and focus on it based on the issue, somebody's going to win and somebody's going to lose. But what's going to happen is a relationship is going to be destroyed. But if I deal with it based on interests and who-ness, I go to that pastor who's in charge of that event and I say, let's sit down and let's deal with this. We got an issue, so let's sit down and deal with it. And I say to them, uh, what, what do you have going on? Well, we have a volunteer appreciation luncheon. Ah, it's a luncheon. So you need the kitchen. Oh, I got to have the kitchen. Well, the kitchen's hooked to the fellowship hall. I don't have to have the kitchen. But my problem is I've got prospective students and parents coming. They're coming to this room. Let me make a call to the events coordinator and see if the prayer chapel is available. So I call over and I tell them, now we've got an issue here. And I tell them what's happening. In, in reality, they're probably the problem because they double booked it some way. But I'm not going to blame them. Why deal with the issue? Why not deal with the interest? We both have interests. I asked the events coordinator, is the prayer chapel available? They look it up and they say, yeah, it's available. Okay, fine. We'll We'll, we'll, we'll allow the volunteer appreciation to be in here. We'll go to the prayer chapel. Mark us down for the prayer chapel. Okay, you're marked down. Then I say to the pastor over the volunteer, okay, your interest is you need the kitchen, we don't. But my problem now is I had people scheduled to set this up. We're already late and I don't have enough workers. But you've got all kinds of volunteers around here. I'm giving you the room, but can you give me some help? I need two or three people to help me make these changes. I also would need somebody to stand at this door so that when our people come say, well, there's been a change of location for that room. Um, so uh, uh, we're going to uh, allow you, your, your event is going to be over here and we'll show you how to get there. Could you help me out with these workers? Oh yeah, I'll give you all the help because I got lots of help here. What's happened? We've saved a relationship. We've saved two ministries because we dealt with each person's interests instead of the issue. If we had dealt with it based on the issue, we've got a loser and a winner. If we deal with it based on interest, we can both be winners. That's what we call collaboration. We sat down and collaborated so that we could both. Now, we might have been collaborating, and all of a sudden, both of us have to give up something in, for both of us to win something. That's what happened. I gave up a location. They gave up some workers. So what is that? Compromising. We've compromised so that we can both win, okay? So the daughters responded to mom as controller or external authority. 
The moment mom picked up one end of the control stick, which was her choice to split, not peel the orange, she had to pick up the other, which was consequences. But you can't control people or consequences. Principles control consequences. People can't. Orange peelers transform. Orange splitters conform. Orange peelers influence. Orange splitters control. Orange peelers are servanthood leaders. Orange splitters are codependent creating authoritarian leaders. Orange peelers are ontological thinkers, which means being in relationship. But orange splitters are Cartesian thinkers. Orange peelers draw people into oneness by vision making. Orange splitters drive people into strife by crazy making. Orange peelers unlock and loose forgiveness. Orange splitters bind and retain unforgiveness. Orange peelers are into plurality and community but orange splitters are into singularity and individualism. Finally, orange peelers minister from who-ness to whatness, but orange splitters minister from whatness to who-ness. We are our paradigms. Why the parable of the orange? We want you to think orange to become an orange peeler and not an orange cutter in half. And that's what this course is all about. The spirit of orange peeling that leads to the byproduct of community. It's Orange Peeling 101. If we deal with interests, the interests of the people, rather than the issues, we keep people from getting in positions that lock them into strife. We unlock people by finding out what their interests are and dealing with everybody's interests. Does that make sense? Any questions or comments? I don't think so. That made a lot of sense and was very informative. And see, that's, that's the foundation of what we need to understand when it comes to conflict management. Mm -hmm. There's right ways and there's wrong ways to deal with conflict. Mm -hmm. One of our pastors just pointed out, Dix, we have like a, a staff chapel as well every week. And one of, we've been on this huge um, unity kick because we have four different campuses. Right. So you, you have to have a lot of unity to make that work. And so one of the pastors brought up the point that um, always looking for the win-win situation. Um, it doesn't have to be a, you know, perfect win, but there is always some situation or some scenario where both people come out on top. Yeah, that's it. That's it. And, and, and that's, in, this, in essence, the parable of the orange. We're trying to get everybody to come out on top. Now, sometimes you'll go through the process and, 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 and it, it can't be 100% win and 100% win. So let's get at least 85% win and 85% win. I'm going to give up 15% to get 85 and preserve a relationship. Here, why is this so important when it comes to pastoral care? Because I'm convinced, and I shared this last week, that 90% of the problems that pastors and spiritual leaders engage in, 90% of the problems are due to either not understanding personalities or not knowing how to manage conflict. Okay, I think our time's up. Um, I hope it was informative and helpful. 
and uh, next week we will deal more with biblical counseling and I'll answer any questions on this you might have. Cool. Anything for me before we sign off? I don't think so. God bless you all. You too. How, do, um, how does uh, Michaela access the recording? You know what I think I'll do? I think I will see if I am able to um, just email it to you guys. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not sure I can do that. I will try that. If not, I'll have to figure out how to put it on uh, uh, Discovery. But I think I can just email it to you. You should be okay. able to, um, to download it and email it. Yeah. And if, if, if you haven't heard from me by, let's say, uh, uh, Thursday night, uh, let me know and, and, and that'll remind me. Okay. okay. Send me an email. Okay. Awesome. Okay. Good. Have a great night. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Later.